On the 22nd of April 1915, the German army poured over 150 tonnes of lethal chlorine gas into no man's land, kicking off what would become known as the Second Battle of Ypres and marking the first use of poison gas on the Western Front. The French and British armies were completely and utterly unprepared, and the French colonial, British and Canadian troops only just held on by the skin of their teeth and by soaking handkerchiefs in water or urinating on their socks and holding them over their faces. Over the coming weeks, simple but desperate measures were introduced to try and combat the new threat, mostly consisting of goggles and different types of pad filled with cotton or cotton waste. But on the 10th of May, Dr Clooney McPherson went to see the War Office Anti-Gas Department, which had only recently been set up, with a very simple design. It involved a flannel bag made of the same silver grey material that the soldiers' shirts were made of, with a mica window set into the front. And the bag was soaked in a solution of sodium thiosulfate, which was also known as hypo or photographic fixer. And the idea was that you would put the bag over your head, you would tuck it inside your jacket, button it up to keep the gas out, and you would literally just breathe in and out through the cloth, and the gas would stick to the outside. It was very, very simple and quite effective, and certainly saved an awful lot of lives. One of the problems, of course, being that the mica window would steam up, so you'd have to rub it on your forehead to clear it. And also, when you're in the bag, as you turned your head, the eyepieces wouldn't necessarily move in the direction that you were. You had to turn your whole body in order to see. But it did save an awful lot of lives. And in fact, this particular one, you can see at the time, uh, the wasting of no materials. It's actually made of two separate pieces in the back just to make use of every single last piece of cloth. Nothing was wasted. And this particular one was worn by Harry Ellis from Ipswich. Harry served with 11 Field Ambulance Royal Army Medical Corps in the 4th Division for the entire war. He was a pre-war territorial and would later go on to be awarded the Military Medal during the fighting on the Somme. We're incredibly lucky that Harry decided to keep his first gas hood and uh, not just the hood itself but he also kept the original haversack that it was carried in. And uh, as you can see here just two cotton tapes around the edges which would hold it shut and then open it up and you can see that it's made of rubberized canvas and the idea of the rubberized canvas was to keep the chemical moist to stop it drying out uh, to keep it effective. So once the thing was folded up and put into the bag the tapes were then fastened around it and obviously the bulk of the hood would bulk it out and hold it shut and it had a, a long thin tape which would either go around your neck or around one shoulder. And very often you see these dangling underneath the bottoms of the tunics with the, with the sling worn underneath. Uh, and it still has Harry's number, 2124, written on the outside of the bag. So, it, it, I mean, it's quite a, a rare survivor anyway, but uh, even rarer to actually know whose it was. Um, one of the big problems with the, the hypo hood, as it was known, was that that mica window was very, very brittle. And if you didn't fold it up properly, it was very easy to break it. In fact, you can actually see very clearly here how Harry had kept his folded up so that the window didn't get damaged. In fact, I've even seen them with, a, with like a wooden block that, uh, or a, a wooden board that went in the back to make sure that you couldn't break it. Um, the other problem was that the technology, the science, if you like, for poison gas was moving apace. And so these single layers of flannel, when they were eventually re replaced in the September of 1915, I mean, there'd been two and a half million of these made between the June and the September. But by the time they were finally replaced, they were replaced with this, the, the P-type hood. And the P-type looks very similar, but instead of being a single layer of the flannel, it's actually two layers of flannelette. So a slightly looser weave, but two layers of it. So you're still breathing in through the cloth. But this time, to stop it misting up, instead of breathing back out again, uh, it had a metal tube inside that you would grip with your teeth. So there it is, metal tube with, the, with a, a rubber protector on the end to protect your teeth. So again, you breathe in through the cloth, out through the tube to stop it misting up. And consequently, when these were first introduced, these were called the tube helmets. The eyepieces, uh, again, instead of this very, very brittle mica, this time two proper metal eyepieces uh, with glass inside them. So it was a, a much more sturdy, a much more robust helmet. And when the P-type is introduced in the September, it's soaked in a solution of phenate, uh, which is 
proving to be much more successful uh, against uh, certainly against the chlorine and, and some of the other gases that have started to appear rather than the, the hypo. Um, and then in the December of 1915, the Germans used phosgene gas for the first time. And at that point, even the phenate is no good and it has to then be mixed with a solution of hexamine. And the phenate and the hexamine then prove um, a, a powerful enough uh, deterrent to the chlorine and the phosgene and some of the others. And this type of gas helmet will actually stay in service uh, pretty much until the end of the war. In theory, it's replaced with the small box respirator towards the end of 1916, and certainly every soldier had the small box respirator. But you do still see the, the PH helmets uh, worn right until the very end, usually as a sort of an insurance policy. So if the um, if the small box respirator, if it got damaged because the face piece was very, very fragile or, uh, or if the, the filter got clogged because eventually the gas will just block the filter, then the fella still carried these uh, as that insurance policy to make sure that they still had a backup. So as I say, in order to wear them, the soldiers would literally just unbutton the tunics and the hood would then be pulled over the top of their head like this and they would grip the tube in their teeth and then button up the jacket all the way around. It was an incredibly simple but effective design. So it's as easy as that. Uh, in the photograph you saw a soldier of the middle sex wearing his cap on top of the gas hood. Um, you'll also see photographs sometimes as fellas wearing steel helmets on top of theirs. Um, almost certainly just portrait pictures uh, taken to send home. Uh, the, the rules were very clear. You never wore anything on top of your gas hood simply because you're going to wear out the seam and then it's not going to work. Um, the metal tube for the tube helmet would have had a rubber exhaust valve on the front. Um, you can see here from, the, from this one from our film and television hire stock, you see the, the valve there. Um, so again, you breathe in through the cloth, you breathe out through this one-way valve to, to stop the eyepieces misting up. But as I say, nearly nearly every surviving example that's just gone brittle and snapped off all these years later. Um, and again, for, for care, for looking after it, the rules were very clear, exactly like the other one. Hold it under your chin, fold both sides in, and then fold it neatly so that it would fit inside the rubberized wallet, which would then go in the khaki haversack that it was carried in. Um, so, a very, very simple design, very effective design uh, from the May of 1915. Uh, as I say, still used right the way through until the end of the war as a backup. And uh, for such simple ideas, these really did save an awful lot of lives.